Good morning. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce McDaniels Marketing for um, our session this morning for Are You Feeding the Hummingbird? Randy McDaniels is the president of McDaniels Healthcare Marketing and, Inter and McDaniels Interactive. He's the current, he was the current treasurer, but now he is our current board president of the Illinois Society for Healthcare Marketing and Pub Public Relations, which he's been, been a member of in, since 1989. He holds a bachelor's degree in marketing from Bradley University and has over 14 years of experience with online marketing. With an ever-expanding knowledge of search engine optimization, pay-per-click marketing, and social media, Randy uses his 27 years of marketing consulting experience to help his clients succeed. Susan Chrysler is the Interactive Project Manager at McDaniels Healthcare Marketing and McDaniels Interactive. Susan has managed McDaniels SEO clients for the past year. She was involved with the very first content management system developed for Caterpillar, Inc., and also involved in content management of the first cat.com website. With a bachelor's degree in business management from Western Illinois University, Susan has focused her past 15 years in small business operations and web development. So please help me welcome um, McDaniels Marketing. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. Everybody see okay? All right, cool. Okay. We're a little angled here. We had to do what we had to do. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about um, Google today and what we call the hummingbird algorithm. But before we get into that, can I have a show of hands of, of, of everyone that understands what SEO is and has a good handle on it and is currently doing it? Okay, so everybody's got a, got a general idea and they're, and they're active and involved in SEO. Good. Um, as you know, an SEO program is not a one and done type of thing. Okay, it's, and we used to try to do that years ago and I think we could optimize the site upon launch and we'd be finished. And once we tagged everything, we were good. It's really more of a long term strategy now. So it's, it's about a continual process of, of looking at the content and the keyword evaluation in comparing that to the algorithm changes of Google. It looks more at the big picture, really, of all the interactive elements and how those pieces function and fit together. So, having said that, does this remind you of anyone? <laughs> remember back, for those of you that, uh, like me, that it's, it's been a while since we've been in college, I remember doing research papers and going in the library, and I used to depend a lot on the librarians to help find the best answer I possibly could find. And really, you can think of Google as the grand librarian, the best librarian you can find, uh, where, you know, where she's trying to, to find the best possible uh, answer to your question, the, you know, the most relevant information in the front of that little card deck they used to pull out and hand you the cards to go find the periodicals. Really, that's all Google's trying to do. It's just trying to be a really good librarian and trying to find out as much about you and what you're looking for to deliver the best possible relevant content. So that hopefully does it in a little bit more friendly way than that. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the releases that we've seen with Google over the last few years. Um, if you follow any of the, the internet changes and trends, you pretty much are hearing about a different animal release every few weeks, it feels like. but. Really, um, what Google's trying to do when they're announcing these, uh, these changes is trying to figure out a way to give you the most relevant, correct results the first time. And so that's what all these algorithms have been doing over the last years. And I know probably everybody in this room has done a search, typed it in, you get a list of results back, and you either look at that list and go, this doesn't mean anything to me. Or you click into a page and you think, why in the world did I get this? Well, these algorithms are trying to cut down on that, simply put. So back in February of 2011 was one of the big first releases. And it was originally named Farmer. They renamed it to Panda. I don't know why they started to go with the animal trend. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But basically, the goal with this algorithm was to stop sites with poor quality content from showing up in the top search results. Um, it cracked down on sites that had high add to uh, content ratios, thin content, and content farms. 
Then that following spring, we heard of Penguin. And Penguin penalized sites that focused on keyword stuffing and unnatural backlinks. So if you thought you were going to a site and you pull up this page and you see your keyword and it's like 500 times on the page, they're saying, no, no, you're not gonna do that anymore. And then we've got this cute little bird that brought us here today. And Hummingbird has had really the biggest impact on everybody. Um, it has essentially changed the whole way search happens. It used to be that when you typed something in, you got back a result based on that keyword. Now it's turned into a semantic search. So it's focused on quality content and understanding who you are to give you the best information. And then we actually had one come out this summer which was called Pigeon. And Pigeon actually is a really great thing to have happened. Um, Pigeon focuses on giving you better results for your local brick and mortars. So when you're on your phone and you're doing a search for some sort of restaurant or bar or whatnot, it's picking up your coordinates, your information, any searches you might have done previous to that to give you the right result locally. Hmm? Sorry, our birds are getting in the way. Yeah. So how does this relate to healthcare? And how do these updates from Google really affect how, the, how your websites perform overall? If you look at the statistics right now, it's, it's really staggering when you look at the number of searches that are performed per day. You have 5.9 billion searches executed online per day. So, I mean, it's probably crazy when you think about how many times we all in this room use Google every day or some other search engine. And then when you start to distill that down, in the past year, 75% of Americans have conducted a search related to their personal health. And then diluted again, 80% of those online health queries began with a search engine. So, so Google's really important to healthcare marketing. And then one more time of distilling, you have half of all those patients who use the internet to self-diagnose <laughs> who end up making a, do a doctor's appointment. So we all know they shouldn't be self-diagnosing, but they are getting appointments. So this is why we're spending a lot of time right now marketing physicians through pay-per-click and also through content marketing. I mean, it's pretty easy to see that right there because that's where they start. They usually start with a position, okay? So here's a little bit of overview of what Hummingbird is. You know, what is a semantic search? Well, you know how you start to type into Google and you feel like Google's your big brother right here and you get two characters into your typing and it already knows what you want? I mean, that is just really freaky. Remember when that started? And that's when they made their tool really, really smart well, it's really because they collect all this data on you and know exactly what you're looking for in most cases. Um, so the more you use their tool, the more they know about you. The more you fill out online, the more they know about you. So you do a Google search executed, and it looks at all, this, all these combined factors for the semantic search. So Facebook, what you like, your, prof your profile on Facebook. Twitter, and who you follow. Um, other social media, okay, like Instagram, for example. Personal information that you filled out in forms that's been shared. Uh, what your friends like, online reviews you post, those are huge, okay? Because online reviews are basically like blog posts. And your blog, your blog entries on your site are, e are even more significant. Past searches, your actual location, of course, is really key. And then what you follow even on Pinterest. I mean, really, they put all that together and how it relates to what they know about you. And that just helps them make them sm really smarter. So we're gonna do an example here. Let's take football as a search word. And let's not even talk about the bears, okay? Let's just set them aside, okay? Because they're very sick and they need healthcare, especially <laughs> Jay Cutler. So we have two examples here, myself, Randy, and, then my, and my wife, Kendra. I should have put a picture of her up there, but that was, I'm just remiss in doing that. Uh, so if I were to search the word football, what, and what if she searched the word football, you would get two very different things. So what Google knows about me is that I get ESPN alerts a lot, and it does irritate people when it bangs it in my phone. Uh, 
I have liked different sports-related Facebook posts. I've been on StubHub before to buy game tickets. And, of course, I live in Pekin, Illinois. And with Kendra, she shops for women's clothes online in a broad way, right? A lot of different online stores. Subscribes to parenting blogs. Of course, she lives in Pekin. Hopefully, she lives with me. Uh, so she searches online with, for health topics. Um, she pins on Pinterest, different food appetizers, and then she's also part of the uh, school board or PTA. Okay, so with that information, Google re would probably s serve these results. So they would send me links to game day dates, schedules for Bears and Rams. And Rams, even though I'm not a, a Rams fan, is because I live closer to St. Louis. Okay. Links to sports blogs, links to StubHub for tickets, ESPN items. Her, her results will be much different, yet similar. Uh, links to sites for women's football jerseys, so of course it relates clothing to football. Game dates for schedules for Bears and Rams, and also the local school team. Recipes for game day treats, and then information on football concussions. That is, if we actually had sons, which I'm like Charles, we don't. So it's all about swimming. <laughs> so... So any questions on that right there before we get into this a little bit deeper on Hummingbird, okay? Because it's, it's really all about content. And that's why content marketing talks are so popular right now. But this, this gives you a little bit more information about how this, it all comes to play. So here's another example, Duke Medicine. We've been studying this site quite a bit. Of course, it's the great Duke from out North Carolina. And... When you really look at how people are searching for answers to healthcare, it's kind of crazy the way we develop websites with departmental pages. And we have a tendency to do that. We want to roll out everything we have. You know, we're a service organization, so we're going to tell you everything we have rather than making it more intuitive to say, well, what's wrong with me? Who can I see to be diagnosed? And how can I be treated? And if I need other information, that's great. And that's kind of what Duke has done here. They flip-flopped it all. They've actually turned their website into a big search engine. So the first thing you see is a search bar, and it helps you get right into information you need. It, it, it doesn't you know, weigh you down with a lot of other posts and information. It just It's very helpful right away. And then you have treatment. So they reorg their content to be treatment-focused rather than service-focused. So doctors, treatments, and then the rest of it. So when you look at content is king, just keep these, this one big takeaway in mind. The old CEO, oh, I said CEO. The old SEO is how do I rank for this keyword? The new SEO is really how do I best answer the question my users have? That's the big change with Hummingbird, okay? And this page just gives us another illustration once you click into the treatments of showing how the content is organized and how they can still just keep on going into the layers and layers to get the answers that they're going to need. Now, if we look at the broad picture and figure out what makes good hummingbird content, there's a few different pieces. So first, it needs to satisfy the searcher's basic information requirements and it offers deeper content to provide thorough information. So what does that mean? It means that when you're developing your content, you have to develop it from a patient perspective. You have to write to the patient. You can't write at a clinical level. It scares patients. It overwhelms them. They want to know that they can easily understand what you have on that page so that they can either ask more questions or continue on in your site. Um, and then, following with that, your content is organized in a manner that is question-answer based. So, like Randy was talking about earlier, when you're typing in those queries into Google and it's starting to populate, you know, the different phrases, you have to think in that manner as you're developing your content and even go so far as to start to structure your pages that way. So, what can I expect from a hip replacement? Um, you know, what are the risks? What are the benefits? Um, it's kind of a few other examples would be like, you know, <clears throat> what can cause sleep apnea? Uh, 
who offers hyperbaric treatments for my diabetic wounds? You know, those, that's what people do. I mean, they're looking at, you know, I've got this issue, I've got this problem, I'm gonna ask a question. I want Google to tell me what, I, what do I need to do and who do I need to see? So it's aligning that content to where they get to that page and it's like, boom, right away, it's already restating the question and it's answering the question rather than, well, you know, we're super proud of our technology and, and then we've got these physicians, you know what I mean? It just, we have a tendency to kind of go on about ourselves rather than being helpful. So helpful is a key word from this talk today. Uh, our third item is it needs to be written by a human and not duplicated elsewhere. So the trend that I realized coming in to McDaniels a year ago and starting to work with healthcare content is a lot of the pages that I would come across came directly from a brochure. And, you know, that's how you had to get your pages up. And, and it worked for a time, but in today's age, it's not enough. So we can't copy the brochures anymore. We have to write the content. And then we have to make sure that it's not duplicated anywhere else. You cannot copy and paste. You might be saying the same thing on two separate service pages or treatment pages, but you can't copy and paste that. Google will look at that, and they will ding the site because they don't feel like you're taking the time to write relevant content. You're taking the easy way out, the convenient way out to put extra, you know, the same content on there. Um, and then with content for number four, you need to make sure that it's actual true HTML content. So it's great and you wanna have supporting graphs and images, but if you're putting relevant information in type on those images, make sure it's also in the content. Google can't read inside that image to pick up a keyword. Uh, same way with PDFs. It'll still kind of traverse through PDFs to pick up keywords, but again, it's saying, hey, why aren't you really building this into a page? So, and then going along with your content is how deep can you provide this content? Can you give them videos, audio, graphics, photos to help communicate whatever you're trying to get across? And it goes without saying, you need to proof your pages. You know, you can't put the pages out there that have the typos and the misspellings. And then finally, bringing it all together. How do you tie it into those social media channels? Because if you're writing about orthopedics on your website, and then you're talking about it on your blog, and you're putting on Facebook, hey, come to our seminar, or you know whatever it might be. Google's noticing, hey, they're using orthopedics here, 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 and somebody else is sharing it here, 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 here. So all of a sudden, your relevance has gone up. And Google says, yay, you know what you're talking about. So if we break the content down a little bit further, content is comprised of keywords. Um, keywords are ultimately the foundation of your content, pure and simple. And you're, whether you're partnering with somebody or you're doing this on your own, you need to spend some time doing some research on what other keywords can be used to tie into that same subject matter. Um, you shouldn't use all of them, obviously, because that's just gonna look weird and sound weird, but you can talk in a variety of different ways with them. So your keywords need to be natural, conversational, you have to have the variety, um, use synonyms, and then one topic per page. It might be easy to try and combine some topics, but it can confuse Google. And if you're confusing Google and Google's not completely clear on what you're trying to communicate, chances are your patient might not be that clear either. And we just touched on synonyms. So to give you an example, you know, the President of the United States is a great example. No booing. <laughs> we put appropriate <laughs> synonyms up here. So, you know, other ones, we'll just leave them off. But, um, you know, people will refer to him as President of the United States, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama's husband, whatever. But it's just going to illustrate that there's a lot of different ways you can say something. So, you know, when you're building your list of keywords, look at synonyms, how that breaks out. So that way it avoids duplicate 
content, but that's also a way Google can find you if you use a lot of synonyms for different things, even in your tags and so forth. And we're going to cover tags here in a little while. So if we pull all of this together and look at it from a high level, we're uh, illustrating Rochelle Community Hospital's bone density page. And we are using keywords in a variety of different ways. We are referring to bone density or the DEXA. We continue to follow bone density throughout our main headings. But then within the copy, then we start talking about osteoporosis, broken bone. Stuff that's still related to the topic, but we, we don't have to just keep on repeating those same words over and over again. Okay, so Hummingbird is a big component of SEO, but it's not SEO. So how do we take Hummingbird and apply it with SEO to give this great, solid internet presence? And basically, there are, actually there's over 200 components that you can optimize for SEO, which we're not gonna get into all of those. Mm -hmm. But we'll highlight some of the bigger areas and talk about their importance, which include your linking strategies. Um, we've already kind of touched on this about the duplicate content, uh, leveraging your other social media channels. Randy just mentioned tags a few minutes ago, so we'll highlight that briefly. And then the importance of having a simple architecture and layout for your sites. And finally, um, and actually we're gonna lead off with this importance of our responsive design. So how many people in the room have a responsive website? One, two, three, four. I see. Well, <coughs> so you're about, about half. Okay. And that's about where we're, where we're at with a lot of our clients, too. We're about, about halfway there with a lot of them. So really important when you look at, um, just from if we look at our own traffic reports for the clients we're serving, they're at about 30% of their overall traffic comes from a mobile device. So it's really, really gaining steam very quickly. So it's important for us to look the same everywhere and have systems where it's easy to, to update across those various devices. So that's kind of a no-brainer. But when you look at 80% you know, of consumers use multiple screens sequentially across uh, to accomplish a task over time, and then 97% of consumers move between multiple devices in the same day, and that's pretty significant. So we got to pay attention to that. And then simple architecture and layout. Again, it goes without saying, but we can get kind of busy with, with our websites, especially home pages, where everybody wants everything on the home page. So that's just something to continue to push back and, and to try to bring you know, some of these kind of principles to your team so they understand why you're making decisions on content and graphics. Uh, we also want to look at uh, friendly URLs. Um, advertising URLs and also friendly URLs, both, both important to use. Uh, and then browser favicons. Um, does everyone have a browser favicon? You know what that is? You have a little, a little logo that appears in your URL. That's a simple thing. Google does like that. It's a very simple thing to do. But just um, a lot of times we run into sites that don't have one. So it's just a part of your logo usually. Okay, so if we get into clean design, I'm going to just show some real examples. Um, and I'm not by any means trying to bash this hospital. You know, we all do what we can to get our information out there in our presence. But this particular site is a good illustration of kind of some things of what not to do when we're talking about trying to get something clearly communicated on a home page. Um, unfortunately, the red is kind of working against their design. It's distracting. You, you don't necessarily even see the content because you're overwhelmed by the color red. Uh, their navigation on the left-hand side, and I apologize because it's really faint for their for the type, so I apologize if you can't see it, but it's not intuitive. It's actually rather long. It's not clearly defined. Um, as I already talked about, you know, the font is small. Um, this site, when I researched it, is not a responsive site, so we know that we're already going to be missing out on valuable traffic. Um, the phone numbers are not clickable. So why is that important? 
well, we've been talking about how important the responsive design is. And if you're on your phone and you need to make that appointment, or even like what they were illustrating in the last discussion, and you don't have that click to call function, now all of a sudden it's like, okay, hold on, I'm gonna punch it in. And it, it just diminishes the experience. Um, and something basic, but with this particular site, their logo is not clickable. And industry standard has kind of dictated that people will look for that logo to take you back to the home page. So if we illustrate somebody that's doing something well and we look at Culbertson's website, they're using color to highlight the areas of importance. It's not overwhelming the page. It's clearly organized and you can easily understand where you need to navigate to quickly. Going on to simple architecture, if we come back to Brown, it's really hard to tell, but when I clicked into their service area, this is where, this is the sub pages that I got, which are very compressed, and it's like, okay, what, what kind of information can I get here? Well, when I click on general surgery, and it brings me over to this other page, very limited content, and now all of a sudden my navigation is gone. And I sit there and I go, okay, well, I don't really want to be on the general surgery page. I needed to be on something else. How do I get back? In turn, I have to go all the way back to the service, click the service, and then try and go through it again. So it's creating a lot of extra steps that should not be there. However, if we come over and look at Rochelle, it's very clean. You automatically know where you need to go. And if I click into their service area, and I want to understand more about diagnostics, well, one, their services are going to come up in a very organized manner. But then as diagnostics opens, then I get more drop downs. So you know you're getting into that tree structure. And it helps people. It simply does. It's an easy way to navigate. And once I'm in that page, now I've got four different options to go somewhere else. I've still got my clean navigation on the left side. This up here is what's called a breadcrumb. So it's following your trail through the site. So I can even click backwards to get back to the previous page. We've got the industry standard of using the logo to go to the home page, or we can even go further with the search. Let Randy talk about the friendly URLs. Another question for the group. How many of you have sites that automatically create user-friendly and SEO-friendly URLs? So about four. Yeah, and that, that's an issue we see quite a bit too, is that you know you just gotta love the cat equals 61 mm -hmm. and question mark ID equals 174 and yeah. Okay, so that makes it hard for Google to find that content as well. So, and it's hard for people to cut and paste I mean, they have to cut and paste in that case. Um, so, you know, it's like YouTube links are the same way. I wish, you, I wish YouTube would fix that too. So you didn't have to cut and paste YouTube links if you go to another machine into a Word file just to play them, which I have to do all the time. So it, it's trying to make your site friendly to everybody, to users and Google. So you have, you know, you have those pages, that, the URLs that are similar even to your advertising URLs. A lot of times you forward those to a page, but if you can get them close, that's just another you know, good practice. And to play on these URLs, if you have the opportunity to do the URL, when you're putting those keywords into that navigation, that's another reinforcement to Google to say, hey, this is about service, you know, the service sleep center for IBCH or the heart care. It's not about web page ID. So if they're seeing it in there and then all of a sudden they're seeing it on your page, it's like, okay, check. Check, check, and you're starting to get all these little positive reinforcements then from Google. Which leads into tags. So for some people, understand SEO programs, this can be a little overwhelming because it touches a little bit at a programming level. So I'm gonna to try to explain this at just a basic business level because tags are very important for your program. They pretty much work like a puzzle, puzzle pieces coming together. So we're gonna start off with title tags. Title tag, very basic. Depending on what browser you're in, if you look up in the corner of where your URL is displaying, it is going to display the title of your page. And 
The big takeaway with this is it shouldn't be more than 65 characters, okay? And your title tags need to be unique for each page. Um, ultimately, those first few words should be the keywords of what that page is. And if you have room, getting your business, getting the hospital name in there, your business name, and even a location. So you kind of have to play with these a little bit. There's not an exact way to do each one. But if you keep in mind that you need to be under those 65 characters, it should be good. Now, we'll move on to the meta description. And this isn't something that you can see on the website. It is put into the programming. And you can think of the meta description tag as your online commercial for that page. When you put a search into Google, so I typed in sports medicine Peru, Illinois, and I got a list of results. And one of them was um, sports medicine for IBCH. The content that is displaying below it is my meta description tag. So the meta description tag is again going to be leveraging those keywords. You get more character space with this though. It, depending on what expert you're talking to, it's roughly anywhere between 160 and 170 characters. The reason being, Google will cut it off and drop it off. So if you stay within that, then you have the whole, you have the likelihood that everybody's going to see what you're trying to say. Again, they are uniquely written. Do not copy and paste these. What we see a lot is with uh, hospital websites, there'll be one specifically put together for the homepage, and then it's just carried on for each page after that. So we don't want to do that. We want to have something that is unique for each page. Something you'll notice, we leave that up for a mm -hmm. second. Notice how the meta description, the words in the meta description are, are basically more keyword insertion. So they're not worded like the way you would write a really pretty paragraph. You have repair of knees, so it's meniscus repair of knees instead of repair of a menis meniscus in a knee. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with labor, labrum repair of shoulders. So you have repair of shoulders is in there in case they search for that. Or if they, if they do labrum repair, that's in there too. So we're placing those phrases that they're searching for rather than making that pretty. A lot of people do that. They'll write the meta description and they'll write it really nice and smooth like you would in a newsletter. But it needs to be more about plunking those keywords that you know are high, high use, high density keywords that people are using to search a lot. And that is one other thing we didn't mention is that all of this starts with seeing how, um, you know, whether any of these search terms are high volume. Are people actually using the two words together or single words? If they're not, then who cares? I mean, if they're real low search volume, it's, it, it's pointless to try to incorporate them. So that's just an example of kind of how to dissect how that one was done. Our third component is your H tag. So when you're looking at your content page, you have your page organized by headings. You know, each heading describes what that particular uh, paragraph is about. If you take it one step further and actually define those headings in the code as H tags, then it's communicating to Google, hey, this is what my page is about. So your H tag is your number one topic. It's the whole overarching um, subject matter for the page. Then your H2 are your supports for this. So it is um, still using a keyword, hopefully the same keyword or a variation, a synonym of it. And then your H3 is uh, just another support. So, and you can have pages that have an H4, an H5, and an H6, you know, but if you're getting that in depth on a page, then you may need to ask yourself, should this be split into a couple of pages? You know, is, is it really necessary? And if we look at it in a real example, going back to Rochelle's site, when we look at their orthopedics page, our orthopedics has been defined as our H1 tag. Then our H2 tags are the orthopedic specialists in Rochelle available five days a week, what to expect at your first orthopedic visit. So those are defined as H2 tags. And going, you know, we don't even use the word orthopedic, but saying surgical, non-surgical treatments, you're still using your keywords. If we wanted to put an H3 tag in, that could simply be call us to schedule an appointment. And then uh, getting in, simply put, with image alt tags, 
If you've got images on your pages, make sure that when your programmer or web person is putting it into the site, that they're putting a name with that tag. So with IVCH, you know, they're wanting to show a piece of equipment. So their alt tag says, announcing the new Toshiba Quillum Prime, blah, 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 blah. What that does is if somebody has their images turned off and they're in an image search, that information is going to display. Additionally, if there is somebody that's handicapped and can't necessarily see that, then their device could actually read that out loud to them. Okay, we, we already touched a little bit on duplicate content, but it's, it's very key to, to avoid that even if you, even if you feel um, the pressing need to put the same kind on another page, try to avoid that. Uh, internal links and backlinks seems, seems pretty simple, but as you look down this page, it's important to put relevant links in, not just any links. Don't you know, put 10,000 links down a page, but put relevant links in that are helpful. So, you know, in the case of this page, you know, you have a, a helpful link here that's weekly sports medicine clinic. So that certainly relates to that topic. And then an external link for their impact program, which actually, that actually links off the site. And then a very important component of SEO is to search out those organizations or partners like that that can link back to your site. And that takes some work, but it can be done. You have to contact them and say, hey, you know, here's our page, we're linking to you, will you link to us? And those backlinks really bump up your Google, your Google relevance and Google quality score. And then tying in social media channels. Now this is an example where you want to splash information on your pages about what you're doing on social media. In some cases, doing blog feeds and Facebook feeds is, is very effective. All of that Google takes into context when uh, qualifying your site and scoring your site. So. Now that we're all optimized, what's next? And really what you're talking about is measurement. So you've got to use your analytics. There's a couple of different ways you can use analytics. Certainly Google Analytics is there, which is free. There's also programs like Smarter Stats. And we're starting to look at those programs a little bit more because Facebook uh, advertising doesn't get indexed very well by Google. They're starting to kind of push back on indexing those hits. So you'll you'll see click-throughs on a Facebook report and then they're not showing up through Google Analytics because they don't like each other. So uh, if you use a, a third-party non-biased analytic tool that you maybe pay 10 bucks a month for, you can get more true data on those Facebook clicks. So that's another nugget to pick up today because that's brand new information from this week. So, uh, so establishing baselines. You know, we used to look at just traffic and rankings and primarily for just the home page and maybe a couple other pages. We've completely changed our SEO programs to, to establish baselines on, yes, the home page, but also like 10 key pages of the site that are focused on key, you know, core service lines. Establish a baseline of traffic and then start to run your campaigns and also your SEO program and see how that changes. So that you can see how you're influencing change. It's really, when, you, when it comes down to it, it's traffic and it's forms being filled out it's, it's requests for information, it's appointments. Rankings are great and they, they contribute to that, but it's not just about rankings. It's really about what happened, okay? And then when we measure that pro progress, then we continue to build that and adjust the pages going forward. I'll talk just real briefly about Google Quality Score. How many people in the room do Google AdWords? Pay-per-click marketing, okay. so. Uh, Charles, I'm sure you're familiar with Google Ad Quality Score and how that affects bid rates. So SEO actually can, if you do a good job with SEO and your quality score is up, then your bid rates on pay-per-click can go down. So Google rewards you for aligning to Hummingbird. It rewards you for aligning to all their algorithms and really, you know, building your site to, to be more relevant and to fall into their category of a very high-quality, relevant uh, outlet for information. So, you know, like I mentioned before about being helpful, relevancy and helpful, really important. So the more those pages are written more Q&A like that, the more helpful they are, the less self-serving they are. So you're playing that true nonprofit role, right? In most cases, we're nonprofits here, that you're trying to just help people. And if the content's that way too, 
then it aligns more to those third-party blog sites that people a lot of times will go on that are not trying to sell them. So the, more, the less you sell on your pages, the better as well. You're just trying to help them get to the right position, get the screening, you know, get, get better, get well. And the other, another part of the quality score is optimized pages usually have higher traffic, so they're considered uh, more relevant. And also, again, if you're driving more traffic to those pages by doing pay-per-click advertising, they reward you again. So they reward you for spending money with them. It's pretty simple. They really do. I mean, there's no lie about it. They will. So if you're spending quite a bit of money on Google AdWords and you're driving a lot of traffic to those pages, you know, if that page had zero traffic before and now it has 4,000 unique visitors, your quality score is going to come up because it just, at least it has traffic. That's a start, right? There are a lot of pages within hospital sites that almost have zero traffic, the ones that are really buried in the third levels. So, so that's important to note. So like I said, bid rates actually go down the higher your quality score is. So given that, it makes sense to feed the hummingbird. And I'd like to open up for, for questions. Sure. Um, of course, I, I love the content changing from so service focused to more consumer friendly, um, helpful information. But I guess what, what I want to ask is we make that change for us small hospitals, you know, we're, so far we've been okay with letting you know, Mayo and Cleveland Clinic be the place. And maybe we used to, you know, subscribe to some kind of health library to be able to provide that type of information. And we just develop that content now on our own to be talking about disease. And, you know, it, to me, it kind of puts us at, again, what before we reserved for the big players. Yeah, I think there's a real issue, though, right now, is that people are traveling for their health care. I mean, anybody read any articles about that? People are just getting in a plane, going to Cleveland. Well, sometimes your insurance has changed. Yeah. Well, they have these centers of excellence. I mean, uh, Midwest Rush, uh, Midwest Orthopedics of Rush is a Blue Cross, Blue Cross, Blue Shield preferred provider for orthopedics. Well, that there's reimbursement differences there. Okay, discount differences. So, I don't think we can shy away from being aggressive with our websites because you can't just say, "Well, Mayo's my friend," as much as they used to be because people are traveling. I, mean, you, I think Adam is a real good source because they're non-biased. I mean, they're you just, you know, and they're like coffee and these other publishers of good content. I mean, they're, they're not a part of any health system. You, you buy their content and you flow it in, and that's going to help you because you, they keep creating it. It's hard to keep creating it on your own, and, and that's all, you know, very uh, clinically based, and it's checked over by multiple people, and, you know, you want to make sure what you're putting out there is right and accurate. So um, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think to answer your question, I think we have to be careful of, of I guess, taking a back seat to that. When, when you look at this, and it is about information, where we used to say, oh, we'll just let Mayo answer those, that question. And that's actually better for you to have it on your site, even if you have to pay for some of that to flow in. So and then a differentiator, though, for your smaller hospitals is if you do have people that are going and hitting these big sites and saying, oh, we've, we've got all this, you have the option to write your content to talk to that person. When you come through the door, you're going to be greeted with by our receptionist, or you're going, you know, and actually explain to them that true process. And sometimes that knocks that fear down just enough that they read it and go, you know what? I'd rather be in my backyard than a thousand miles away. So, you know, it's a balance with trying to figure out what content you try and show versus what you leverage from another source. But if you can structure it so that you're still talking to them and saying, we're wanting to help you, and this is the experience you're going to receive from us, it goes a long way. Well, I think the more uh, health systems and hospitals de you know, develop population health programs and screenings and more of that to address that, that's what you can lead with. I mean, I think the first talk this morning really focused on that is assessing risks and then developing screenings to try to get people you know, the help they need. A lot of people don't realize they need help. So that's what, you know, websites can play a major role in that. It's just balancing the amount of content you need as a community provider versus a system or a regional like a Mayo or a Cleveland Club. Any other questions? One more? 
what would you what would your opinion be on the balance between like with the purchase content? Uh -huh. You know, because then it would be duplicated on other possible sites on this But you would get the traffic like you said, you know, if you're local. Right. So what's your recommendation? But it's not duplicated on your site, so you'll be okay. Even if it's on somebody else's site, it's it's okay. It is better to draft your own. It always is to be original if you can. But um, it, you know, it's 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 still permissible to do that. You just don't want to leave with that kind of boilerplate stuff in the very beginning of the page. You saw that that Rochelle example where it was, you know, what is a bone density test? What do I? Why do I need one? How do I get one? You know, just keep it simple. Just you know, open your arms and say, we're here to help you and we're gonna, and we're gonna take you through the process. That's what people want. Like, you know, like Christine said this morning, nobody wants this stuff. <laughs> so we wanna make it easy for them if they really have to get a colonoscopy, <laughs> then make it easier for them to get it and figure out when and where and why, so. And if you keep in mind, like I said, there really are like over 200 areas to optimize. And some of these areas are small, you know, like little, but as you start to combine these areas, then they start to make a bigger impact. So if you know that you're gonna be leveraging a lot of content in a third party source, but you're doing all these other things really well that Google likes, then that impact to your site is gonna be a lot less. But as a whole, if you're not really, you know, trying to cover a lot of them, yeah, then a lot of those dings start to add up and then that's when you start to feel the negative effects. Anyone else? One more. I'm just curious, No, it's a, their own internal search. So that's a custom program internal search. Yeah. So, and those are really important to have. It's a lot better to do that than do a than doing a Google search because then you're sending people off. No, I mean the business site. Yeah. Like a, you know, Google site search or Google search clients or something. Right. Yeah, it's their own. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps people in the site that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? We're getting tight on time, so. Everybody got a lot out of this? Was it good? Yes. yes okay, good. Right. All right. Thank you.